Hafiz TV, the solution for humanity. My question is... How do I know that Islam is the right way? Islam does not believe in idol worship. Why so? Why is Pope Haram in Islam? What really jihad means? I've been studying Islam. There are many questions that go around my head. If you can enlighten the concept of God. I feel I am God. I feel I am God. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Verily, all praise belongs to Allah and to Allah alone. And may His peace and blessings be upon His Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I welcome you, dear guests of the Dubai International Peace Convention, to this our last session with our dear and esteemed Sheikh Dr. Zakir Naik. Professionally, turning around from being a medical doctor to a dynamic da'i, Dr. Zakir Naik is popular for his critical analyses and convincing answers to challenging questions on Islam as well as comparative religion, posed by audiences after his public talks. In the last 15 years, he has delivered more than 1,500 public talks in many countries worldwide. In addition to numerous public talks in India, Dr. Zakir Naik was featured in the Indian Express list of the 100 most powerful Indians in 2009. And again, in 2010, from amongst the billion plus population of India, he has been placed in the top 62 of the list of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world. Published by the George Washington University of the USA. Dr. Zakir Naik appears regularly on many international TV channels in over 200 countries worldwide. He is regularly invited for TV and radio interviews. He has also authored many books on Islam and comparative religion. The ideologue and driving force behind Peace TV is Dr. Zakir Naik. He launched Peace TV English in January 2006, it presently being the largest watched Islamic as well as any religious satellite TV in the entire world. With over 100 million viewership, of which 25% are non-Muslims. In its footsteps, he launched Peace TV Urdu in 2008 and Peace TV Bangla in 2011. To get apt answers to your eager questions, brothers and sisters, let's welcome amongst us this very articulate assertive and astounding world-famous orator on Islam and comparative religion, Dr. Zakir Naik. Now for this session of Ask Dr. Zakir, we will have five mics available. We have three for the brothers, and then we have two in the rear for the sisters. We will take the first three from the brothers, and then the next two from the sisters. As always, we welcome our dear guests. If we have any non-Muslims who would like to ask a question, we will give preference to them to be able to ask their questions first. Please also observe that you ask only one question at a time. If you have another question, 
you may go to the back of the line and have the chance to ask another question. When you ask your question, please state your name and your profession to facilitate in the best and most convenient answer to your question. So before we begin, a short welcome and introduction by our dear Sheikh, Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma abad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Baqul jaal haq wa zaqal batil. Inna al-batil akana zhuka. Rabbi shali sadri. Wa isilli amri. Wa halul ugdat min lisan yafkaw kawli. My respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Alhamdulillah, we are going to have the last session of the Dubai International Peace Convention. And I would like to apologize to the non-Muslims who were standing in the queue yesterday and could not ask questions even though they stood for about three hours. So I requested the chairman of the organizing committee, Dr. Hamad al shaymani to let the session continue. And he said, Alhamdulillah, even if the session continues today, it will fajr, no problem. So I'd like to thank him. As long as the non-Muslims are there in the queue, until Fajr we can go on. I'd like to thank the chairperson. And inshallah, I will try my level best to reply to the questions. I request the non-Muslim brothers and sisters, please feel free to ask any question on Islam and comparative religion. Any query you had, throughout your life, even if it's against Islam, it's against the Quran, I can take it, I'm young. Normally, you don't have opportunities where you can ask any question on Islam and compassion religion. You can ask any question on Islam, on Christianity, on Judaism, on Hinduism, on Buddhism, on Sikhism, on Parsiism. I will try my level best to satisfy your question and query. So please feel free. I request the non-Muslim brothers and sisters to please queue behind the microphones. And I request the volunteers that if they find any non-Muslims, they are our guest of honor in the session. You allow them to come in front of the microphone. And inshallah, I'll try my level best to reply to your queries. We can have the first question from the microphone on the right. Okay, good evening, everybody. My name is Kevin, and I'm a concierge. Uh, today, I'm coming here because I have six doubts, which I believe if I get the right answer, I'm ready to convert and accept to Islam. Uh, to start with, on my first question, is that uh, how do I know that Islam is the right way to worship. And um, I will follow that question with the second question, which goes like, how do I know that the message I'm conveying is going to God? Okay. And my third question, since Dr. Zaki, I've been listening to you before, you have said before and you have preached that uh, there's no way you can go to heaven without strictly abiding to the commandments that were given to Moses. In the present world and challenges with the media, with everything that comes to along to our life in our present day, how do we um, abide to this law? And does God forgive you if you repeatedly make mistakes and repent? Brother wants to give in two parts. <laughs> he wants to ask six questions. The first three questions brother asked that how do I know in Islam the worship is correct? It can be understood as 
how we worship in Islam, is that correct? Or it can mean that, is Islam the correct religion? What do you mean? Do you want to know the, that the way you worship in Islam, is it the right way or? Is Islam the correct religion of worship? The first question the brother asked, he wants to know, how will he come to know that is Islam the correct religion we should follow? And the second part that is similar, that how will you come to know that Islam is the truth? Exactly. And the third that he said, I said in one of my speech, that J.S. Christ, peace be upon him, said that if you want to enter Jannah, you should keep all the commandments and follow all the laws mentioned in the Old Testament. How in this age can we follow all the laws of the Old Testament? I will try and club the first two questions together, that how do you know that Islam is the correct religion to worship? And how do you know that Islam is the truth? Islam comes from the word salam, which means peace. It is also derived from the Arabic word film, which means to submit your will to God. Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to Almighty God. And for any book to claim that it is a message from God, for any religion to prove that it is from Almighty God, this revelation, this book, this religion should stand the test of time. Previously, it was the age of miracles. And the glorious Quran is the miracle of miracles. Later on came the age of literature and poetry. Muslim and non-Muslim Arabic scholars alike, they claim the glorious Quran to be the best Arabic literature available on the face of the earth. But today, if a religious book says in a very poetic fashion, the world is flat, will a modern man believe? But naturally no, because today is the age of science and technology. So if we put this test of science and technology to all the religious scriptures that we have today of the different religions of the world, all of them fail the test except the Quran. And I've given a lecture on the topic Quran and modern science, compatible or incompatible. Time does not permit me to give a full lecture in this question answer session. But I'd like to mention that Albert Einstein said, the famous physicist and the Nobel Prize winner, that science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. Let me remind you, the glorious Quran is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, but it's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. And there are more than 6,000 signs, more than 6,000 ayats in the glorious Quran, out of which more than 1,000 speak about science. Now, if you compare the scientific facts that we have come to know, we find that what science has discovered recently, maybe 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back, 400 years back, the glorious Quran has mentioned 1400 years ago. The Quran speaks about the creation of the universe in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. What the scientists discovered recently about the Big Bang. What they discovered 50 years back is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. We came to know that the Earth is spherical in 1577 when Sir Francis Drake sailed around the Earth. The Quran says in Surah Naziat, chapter number 79, verse number 30, that we have made the earth egg-shaped, referring to the egg of an ostrich, and we know the egg of an ostrich is geospherical in shape. We previously thought that the light of the moon was its own light. Recently, we came to know 100 years back, 200 years back, 300 years back, that the light of the moon is reflected light, not its own light. This is mentioned in the Quran 14 years ago, in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61. So who could have mentioned all these facts in the Quran which we came to know recently? Previously, when I was in school, I had learned that the sun revolves but does not rotate about its own axis. Quran mentioned in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 33, that the sun, besides revolving, it also rotates about its axis. Today, science has come to know that besides the sun revolving, it even rotates about its axis, which is mentioned in the Quran 14 years ago. In this way, the Quran speaks about botany, about biology, about zoology, about embryology, about genetics, all which we came to know recently in science, 50 years back, 100 years back, 300 years back, 500 years back. So if we put this test of science today, 
to all the religious scriptures, the only religious scripture that passes this test is the glorious Quran. Today, science hasn't advanced so much that it knows everything. So I tell the people that if you analyze the Quran, we come to know approximately 80% what the Quran speaks about science. Today, science has confirmed it is 100% correct. There may be about 20% which is ambiguous, neither right, neither wrong. So my logic says when 80% is 100% correct, the balance 20%, inshallah, will also be correct. So it is a logical belief. There is not a single verse in the Quran which has been disproved by scientific fact. There may be hypotheses which may not agree with the Quran, but there is not a single verse in the Quran which is disproved by any scientific fact. So based on this, if we put this test to any scripture, the only religion, the only scripture that passes this test is Islam and Quran. I started the question answer session by quoting a verse of the Quran from Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, which says, وَقُلْ جَعَلْ حَقْ وَزَاقَ الْبَاطِلْ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَوْكَ Say that truth has arrived and falsehood perishes. For falsehood, it's by its nature bound to perish. So if you put this test, the only religion that passes the test, the only truthful religion which is not corrupted, that's the reason William Moore said that the only religious scripture, he said 200 years back, being a critic of Islam, the only religious scripture that has not been altered and has maintained its pure form for 1200 years, it is the glorious Quran. So based on these facts, the only religion we can think and can understand and can believe it is truthful and correct, it is the Quran. As far as the third question is concerned, that I had mentioned in my speech, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said that you have to follow the commandments in the Old Testament. I was quoting the verse of the Bible, Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17 to 20, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, in no way shall you enter the kingdom of heaven. So if you have to be a good Christian at the time of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, if you want to enter paradise, you have to follow all the commandments of the Old Testament. You cannot break a single jot or a tittle. If you do that, you shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So based on this verse of the Bible of Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17 to 20, you have to follow each and every law of the Old Testament. And your question was very good and very logical. How can we in this age follow everything of the Old Testament which is difficult, I agree with you. That's the reason Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, also said in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. He said, I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself, all that year shall he speak. He shall glorify me. Your prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, is prophesying the coming of the last and final messenger, last and final prophet, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. That when he will come, he will guide you unto all truth. That means Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, knew that everything what is mentioned in the Bible cannot be followed later on, maybe a few centuries later. That's the reason he said that he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth, talking about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So at that time, maybe it was possible to follow the rules and regulations mentioned in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, in future, when the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, comes, you should follow him. So if you have to be a good Christian today, besides believing in one God, you should also believe in Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Hope that answers the question, brother. The other question is coming from a Christian background with a Christian family. How will I uh, adapt or connect to my family if I convert to Islam and having two different faiths in the same compound? Brother asked the question that if I convert to Islam, how will I connect with my family having two different faiths? Brother, you know there's something like the Old Testament and something like the New Testament. Even though 
you are a Christian, you can follow the laws of the Old Testament after the New Testament has come. If there is something like the Old Testament and New Testament, there's also something like the Last Testament. The glorious Quran is the Last Testament of Almighty God. And in this glorious Quran, not a single prophet which is mentioned in the Bible has been derogated. In Islam, you have to believe in all the prophets that came earlier. And there are no less than 25 prophets which are mentioned in the Quran. And all of them, except for Prophet Muhammad and a couple of them, they are mentioned in the Bible. So we have to respect all the prophets of Almighty God. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that Almighty God has sent 124,000 messengers on the face of the earth. So if you become a Muslim, you do not have to disrespect any of the prophets mentioned in the Bible. In fact, you will have to tell them, I am following 100% what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said. What the other Christians are doing, they may be following 80%, maybe 90%, maybe 50%. You should tell them that Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14 says, I have many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. So I am following Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, much better than the other so-called Christians. So if you become a Muslim, you will be a better Christian than the Christian themselves. Hope that answers the question, brother. Yes. What's the fifth question? <laughs> I just ran out of questions now. <laughs> Fine, so all your questions answered. Yes, it has. Thank you. So now, are you convinced about the religion of Islam? I'm convinced about the uh, religion of Islam, and I'm ready to accept Islam. Do you believe that there's one God? I'm sorry? Do you believe that there is one God? I believe there is one God. Do you believe Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is God? I believe Jesus Christ was the messenger of God. Mashallah. Do you believe, do you believe that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger? I believe Prophet Muhammad was the last and final Mashallah. Brother, is anyone, is anyone forcing you to accept Islam? I'm ready to accept. Is anyone forcing you to accept Islam? Nobody is forcing me. Are it's my decision I'm making will? from myself. Out yeah. of your free will, out of your own conviction? Out of my own heart. Because forcing anyone into Islam is prohibited in our religion and it is prohibited even by laws of most of the countries in the world. So you're doing out of your free will, inshallah. I'm doing it out of free will. I will say in Arabic and inshallah I can repeat it. Ashadu. Ashadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Abduhu. Abduhu. Wa rasuluhu. Wa rasuluhu. I bear witness. I bear witness. I bear witness. I bear witness that that there is no God. There is no God but Allah. But Allah and and Muhammad and Muhammad is is the messenger. The messenger and servant of Allah and servant of Allah. Mashallah, you have become Muslim, Thank and I pray to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that He guides you and He helps you to guide your family to come to the religion of peace. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you the best in this world as well as in the next life. Alhamdulillah. Amen. We'll have the next question from the brother's mic on the left-hand side. Hello, good evening. I am Joshua from the Philippines. And before that, I would like to share that uh, many hundred years ago, the Philippines are mostly Muslims and before the Spaniards came. Now we are mostly Christians, mostly Catholics. In my country, there's a lot of uh, religions, different kind of uh, Christian religions, and most of them claim that uh, if you follow the religion and you come to join them, you have a better chance to be saved, to go to heaven. And uh, I am a Catholic. For me, I think religion is just a, a guide. It is not uh, the religion who can save you. I think it is you. You can save yourself. 
if you do good things, whatever religion you are in. So my question, is Islam is the same as this religion, claiming to be the one true religion that if you embrace Islam, you have a better chance to go to heaven? That's my first name. The, the second one, before I go to the second question, I realize that Islam is all about peace and righteousness, not the other way around that I used to think many years ago. And I'm sorry for that. And uh, I'm really grateful and uh, thankful to the UAE, especially Dubai, and all its leaders for giving us the freedom, the opportunity to live here peacefully and exercise our faith, whether you are a Christian, <laughs> Buddhist, Hindu. I thank you. And I think Dubai, the UAE, is the number one example of peace and unity where all ethnicity, religion come together, work in peace and harmony, peacefully together. Thank you. So I would like to say God bless UAE and all its leaders. God bless Islam. God bless Christianity. God bless Buddhism, Hinduism, and all other religion in the world. God bless to all of us, and peace to all of us. So my second question is, sorry. <laughs> I want to talk about jihad. Brother, this is a question answer time. And no, normally just... a question is only of two or three sentences. Okay, if you speak sorry. for more than two or three sentences, it becomes a speech. We right. want I'm to sorry, be I'm sorry. just. No, I'm sorry. But... I request anyway. the non-Muslim brothers and sisters, this is a question answer time, not a speech time. For speech, inshallah, after everyone gets over, we can sit in the majlis, <laughs> in the guest room, and we can talk. I don't mind, but there are, mashallah, tens of thousands of people here. So let's respect the time. OK. Brother I asked to... a question. I just want to talk about... Uh, if you have any questions, yes. please, only pose the yes, question. Yes, this one. Two or three sentences, brother. I want uh, to know what really jihad means. Because uh, I've seen a lot of in the television, there's a few individuals using jihad in, uh, in a harm way. So what really jihad means to Islam? And, you know, since this is about peace. I request the non-Muslims that it will be preferable if you pose one question at a time. For the second question, you can go behind the other non-Muslims. You don't have to go behind the complete queue. So that, you know, not like yesterday, many non-Muslims couldn't ask the questions. I request the non-Muslim ask one question. If it's an interlinked question, two is acceptable. But if you ask six questions, three questions, four questions, it will be difficult to fulfill and answer all the questions. The brother asked two questions. The first question, he said that he believes religion. This is a guide but he doesn't believe that everything is truthful, that it can take him to heaven. He wants to know what is the position of Islam and can Islam take him to Jannah and what is the Quran? And the second question is, what is the meaning of jihad? As far as the first question is concerned, if you believe that Bible is a guide, if suppose when you appear for an examination, maybe for bachelor's degree. Many a time for every subject there is a guide. Would you like to follow a guide which is an old edition or a guide which is the latest edition? Brother, which guide would you like to follow? Old edition or latest edition? I would like to follow both. Both. So previously, science used to say the light of the moon is its own light. Today, science says light of the moon is reflected light. Which will you believe in? Hold on you. <laughs> Brother, you are from Philippines. I thought Filipinos were intelligent people. Which you follow? Hold on you. Previously, people thought the world was flat. They did not go too far, lest they would fall over. 
Today, science says that the world is spherical. Which will you believe, flat or spherical? Both. Which? No, sir, uh, I'll follow the new. If the old is correct, no problem. Many a time, there are certain things which are correct in the old. So if you compare both, and if you find commonalities, you can follow part of the old and the new one completely. But you should verify whether the new one is correct or not. The earlier question asked by the brother, how do you come to know this guide is truthful? And I told you that today, with the help of science, we can prove the only religious scripture, which is 100% perfect and matches with established scientific fact, it is the Quran. So based on that, if you follow a wrong guide, you may not be successful in the examination. This world, brother, is a test for the hereafter. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah di khalaq al mawta wal hayata. It is Allah who has created death and life to test which of you in good and deeds. So when you appear for the test, you should even read the correct guide. And the last and final guide for the human beings, it is the glorious Quran. After this, no other guide will come. No other messenger will come. So this is the only book that will take you to salvation, that will take you to heaven, that will take you to Jannah. As far as the second question is concerned, that what is the meaning of the word jihad? The word which is maximum misunderstood in Islam is jihad. It is not only misunderstood by the non-Muslims, it's even misunderstood by the Muslims. Most of the non-Muslims and Muslims think that any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for money, whether it be for wealth, whether it be for personal gain, whether it be for fame, whether it be for land, is called as jihad. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim, whether it be for wealth, for land, for fame. Jihad comes from the Arabic word jihada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. In Islamic context, jihad means to strive and struggle against one's own evil inclination. Jihad means to strive and struggle to improve the society. Jihad also means to strive and struggle in self-defense in the battlefield. Jihad also means to strive and struggle against oppression. Jihad basically means to strive and struggle. For example, if a student strives and struggles to pass in the examination, in Arabic we'll say he's doing jihad. Many people have a misconception that jihad can only be done by Muslims. There are no less than two places in the Quran which say that even non-Muslims do jihad. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14, we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In travel upon travel, the mother bore you, and in pain did she give you birth. The next verse, Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse number 15 says, but if your parents do jihad, strive and struggle to make you worship somebody else besides Allah, of which you have no knowledge. Do not obey them, but yet live with them with love and compassion. Quran repeats that message in Surah An-Kabu, chapter 29, verse number 8, that Allah says, we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. But if their parents do jihad, strive and struggle, to force them to worship somebody else besides Allah, then don't obey them. Here, Allah is talking about non-Muslim parents who are forcing their children to do shirk, to worship somebody else besides Almighty God. So here, Allah is saying that the non-Muslim parents are doing jihad. But this jihad is jihad fi sabil shaitan. What we Muslims should do is jihad fi sabil Allah. So whenever the word jihad is used, it is normally used and understood that it is jihad fi sabil Allah unless otherwise. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. And many a time, the Orientalists, they translate the word jihad as holy war. Holy war in Arabic is harbu muqaddasa. This word harbu muqaddasa does not exist anywhere in the Quran. It does not exist in any hadith of the Prophet. This word holy war was first used to describe the crusaders. The crusaders who spread the religion of Christianity with force and killed thousands of people to spread the religion. Today, this word is used for Muslims, for Islam, which is totally wrong. Nowhere does the Quran say that jihad means holy war. 
And Quran is very explicit. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 32, that if anyone kills any other human being, whether it be a Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. There is no religious book in the world which says that if you kill one human being, you have killed the whole of humanity. And if you save one human being, you have saved the whole nation. So how could such a religion which says you cannot kill a single innocent human being promote terrorism? This is mainly the work of the media which is spreading misconception about Islam. <laughs> Hope this answers your question. That's right. So now do you believe that Islam is a religion of peace? Yes, yes. I truly believe. Do you believe in one God? Yes. Do you believe Jesus is God? As as for my religion, yes. I believe he is God, he is son of our Lord. Is there any text in the Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says any unequivocal, any unambiguous statement that you know of in the Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God or where he says worship me? If you can point out any verse in the Bible, unambiguous, unequivocal, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that he is God, or he says, worship me, I will join you in your faith. <laughs> Brother, can you point out a single unequivocal statement from the Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that he's God? Only one, not two. I'm a student of the Bible. Brother, have you read the Bible? To tell you the truth, I'm not good in the Bible. <laughs> so, yes. how come you're following a religion where you have not read the Bible? I have read the Bible, and I'm telling you there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says that he's God or why he says worship me. In fact, if we read the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, he says that my father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devil with the spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20. I with the finger of God cast out devil. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says, I seek not my will, but the will of Almighty God is a Muslim. Jesus Christ, peace be upon the Muslim. It's clearly mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. E men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by him, and you are witness to it. A man approved of God amongst you. Not God. A man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by him, and you are witness to it. So when it's clearly mentioned in the Bible that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was a messenger of God, but not God, so how come you are believing he's God? Because it is what uh, our religion teaches us. Someone taught you. If someone teaches you that 2 plus 2 is equal to 5, will you believe in it? <laughs> yes or no? No, no, no. So now when I'm quoting you so many references from the Bible, do you think I'm lying to you? Mm. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. So what I request you, you go home and check all these references. Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse number 28. Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 29. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse 28. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20. Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse number 30. And you take my DVD on similarity between Islam and Christianity. There are several references which can prove that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said that you should follow the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And inshallah, you will be a better Christian. I believe that Muslims are more Christian than the Christian themselves because we follow more of the true teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, than the so-called Christians. We will have the next question from the sister's mic on the right-hand side. Assalamu alaikum. There is a sister here who is from Philippines and she would like to take shahada, but she says, don't ask any questions, I'm nervous. Okay, okay. Okay, okay.
Unless I'm not convinced that she believes in the basic principles, how can I give a shada? I'd like to ask you, sister, do you believe that there is one God? Come again. Do you believe there is one God? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus is God? Peace be upon him. Allah. She you says don't Allah. Believe. You I don't. believe. Do you believe Jesus is God or do you believe he's a prophet? Prophet. You believe Jesus is prophet of God? Prophet. Do you believe that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final prophet? Yes, I believe. Is anyone forcing you to accept Islam? No one. You're doing it out of your own free will? Yes, Inshallah, definitely. I will say it in Arabic and you can repeat it. Mm. Ashadu. Ashalu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashalu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Abduhu. Abduhu. Wa rasuluhu. Rasuluhu. I bear witness. I bear witness. I bear witness that that there is no God. There is no God. But Allah. But Allah. And I bear witness. And I bear witness that that Muhammad. Muhammad. Peace be upon him. Peace be upon him. Peace be upon him. Is the messenger. He's the messenger. And servant of God. And servant of God. Mashallah, you're a Muslim. Mashallah. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you the best of life in this world as well as in the next life, inshallah. We'll have the next question from the sister's mic to the left. Uh, my name is Renilda and uh, I'm a Christian. Like uh, since a long time I've been having conflicts with myself. The questions that I would like to ask today are mostly like maybe assumptions or like things where I've been influenced from people. Like my first question, it's about uh, pig. Uh, basically, I would like to know what exactly is the meaning of haram. Like uh, is uh, for a religion like Islam, it won't accuse anyone of being wrong, yeah? Uh, it, it wouldn't say something to be so wrong. Why is uh, pig haram? Because uh, I had attended a Christian convention and over there it was told, like there was this priest who was saying that why is pork haram in Islam? Uh, he gave an example saying that uh, uh, like the same rubbish, like uh, it was used as manure for the plants. Uh, the plants, like supposing it was a mango, mango tree, the mango grew, the roots had absorbed the same nutrients the same rubbish, it uh, grew into mango, and we consume it. So how is it different from consuming it in pork and uh, the mango? This will ask the question that what is the meaning of haram, and why is pork haram in Islam? And she gave the example of the priest, a Christian priest who said that many are which is dirt and filth, is used by the tree. The tree grows, and then mango comes, and we eat mango. Trying to say that even if you eat the filth of the pork, it may be good for someone else, may not be good for others. That's what he means to say. So in Islam, it's haram, but Christianity, it's allowed. Sister, first I'll tell you the meaning of haram means prohibited, means forbidden. Haram in Islam means Prohibited, it means forbidden. I will answer your question of the priest first, and then I'll come to the real reason why pork is haram. The priest gives the example that manure is supposed to be dirt and filth, is healthy for the tree, and when the tree grows, it gives mango and we eat the mango. Trying to say that maybe it's haram for Muslims, but good for Christians. If you compare, the manure which is filth for the human beings, it may be good for the plants because plants and human beings are two different beings. They aren't the same. They are different. But in Islam and Christianity, the human beings are the same. 
You may follow different religions, but what is good for one human being as a general thing is good for the other human being unless he has certain problems. For example, if he has diabetes, then sugar may not be good for him, but normally sugar is good. It gives you energy. Unless he has some problem, then it may not be good for him. But as far as general human beings are concerned, the rule for all the human beings, what is good and bad, is the same. So you can't give the example of manure is good for some and not good for other. What we have to see, we have to go to the guide. What does the guide tell us? And we'll try and analyze what does the guide tell us. The guide in Christianity, it is the Bible. The guide in Islam is the Quran. When we read the Quran, there are no less than four different places where the Quran says pork is prohibited. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 173, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 3, in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 145, and Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 115, Hurrimat alaykumul maitu tu waddamu walamun kinzir, wa ma ahulla li gairil labi, forbidden for you for food are ah, dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah's name is taken. So your Quran says in no less than four different places that eating the flesh of pig, pork, is prohibited. Similarly, if you read the Bible, Bible in no less than three different places says pork is prohibited. Bible says in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, <laughs> chapter number 11, verse number 7 and 8, that thou shalt not eat the flesh of swine, nor touch its carcass. It's unclean for you. A similar message is given in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 8. Though the swine has cloven foot and it chews not the cud, it is unclean for you. Similarly, it's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 65, verse number 2 to 5, that you should not have the flesh of swine. So Bible says in no less than three different places that you should not have the flesh of swine. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17 to 20, that think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have come not to destroy but to fulfill. For anyone who breaks one of the least commandments shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. That means if you break one law, one jot or tittle from the Old Testament, you shall not enter Jannah. So as a Christian, if you believe in the Bible, then eating pork is prohibited for you, is forbidden for you, is haram for you. If you are a Muslim, if you believe in the Quran, it is prohibited. If you do not believe in the Bible or do not believe in the Quran, let's analyze what does today's reason and logic and science say about pork. Today, science tells us that if you have the flesh of swine, there are chances that you may have no less than 70 different diseases. You can have pinworm, you can have roundworm. The most dangerous amongst all the diseases, it is tapeworm. It's called Astenia solium. And it harbors in the intestine and is very long. Even if you cook the food very well, the eggs, the ova of Tinea solium, does not die. And from the intestine, through, via the bloodstream, it can go to almost all the organs of your body. It can enter the eye and cause blindness. It can enter the heart and cause heart attack. It can enter the brain and cause brain damage. And by the time you realize you're suffering from the disease, it's an irreversible damage done. Furthermore, today science tells us that when you eat pork, it is more of fat building material rather than muscle building material. That's the reason most of the people who are regular pig eaters, they have got tires, they have got flaps. Today science tells us that by eating pork, there are high chances of having atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis. Today science tells us that if you eat pig regularly, you may have hypertension. That's the reason more than 50% of the Americans today, they're suffering from hypertension because most of them are pig eaters. Today, science tells us that one of the most filthiest animals on the face of the earth is the pig. Wherever you find dirt and filth, you'll find the pig there. Today, science also tells us that pig is one of the most shameless animals on the face of the earth. Pig today is one of the most shameless animal on the face of the earth. It enjoys seeing its spouse, 
seeing its mate have sex with his friend. In the Western countries, we have dance parties. After dance parties, we are swapping of wives. You sleep with my wife, I sleep with your wife. Do you think it's modest? And there is a scientific thing that you eat pig and you behave like pig. <laughs> Hope this answers your question, sister. Yes, very good. Uh, my next question, it's about um, the prasad and charnamrit that's given in the temple. Uh, I would uh, like to know how is it different from like when Muslims go to Hajj, they bring dates and uh, zamzam pani. So why is it like Muslims have to stop themselves from having the prasad or taking the charnamrit? How is it different? Sister asked a very good question. She's saying that when Hindus go to temple, they give prasad. When Muslims go to Hajj, they give dates. So what's the difference? The difference is prasad is food which is put onto gods. In Hinduism, you find the Hindus, Hinduism is separate. The Hindus, what they do, they go to the temple and they give the food to God. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse number 14, Allah feedeth everyone but does not require to be fed. How can we human beings give food to God? Furthermore, Quran says in no less than four different places which I quoted earlier. Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 173. Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 3. Surah Anam chapter 6 verse 145. And Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 115. Hurramat alaykumul maitu tu waddha muwalamul khinzir. Wa ma uilla li gare la bi. Forbidden for you for food, ah? Dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah's name is taken. So if you take on a food, any other name besides Allah's name, it is prohibited. It's haram. When Muslims go, to Hajj or Umrah, when they give date, no one says this date has been given to Almighty God. Date, you know, because one of the main fruits of Saudi Arabia is date. So when you go, we get that fruit just as a gift. No Muslim ever says that this date has been given to Almighty God, to Allah. And date is very nutritious. It's very nutritious and it's very healthy. So this is just as a gift. How you get sweets? You know, when you come from India, you go abroad, you give sweets. So this is a very delicious fruit. And it is the main fruit of Saudi Arabia. It has no link. No one says that this date has been given to Almighty God. If the Hindu gives date to Almighty God, even eating the date is haram. If some Hindu gives date to Almighty God and says this is prasad, eating the date becomes haram. So anyone takes any name besides Allah on that date, that date will also become haram. So that's the difference between Muslims and Hindus. We don't believe that Almighty God requires to eat. We human beings require to eat. Hope that answers the question, sister. Yes, yes. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Yes, yes. The next question... Sister, would, ask uh, a most important question. One more. Most important question. Uh, this uh, main doubt on um, homosexuality. Uh, like, is it prohibited in Islam? And uh, why so? Because, uh, like, I had, uh, like, from the past five years, I've been with so many homosexuals. It's like, uh, I mean, their feelings that they have for, their, for the same sex or whatever it is, it's so true. I mean, it's like the same kind of pain what we might feel for, for maybe our husbands or whoever it is. If it's wrong, why is it wrong? This is the question that what does Islam say about homosexuality, and if it's wrong, why it is wrong? Allah says in the Quran in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 32, that come not close to adultery, for adultery is an evil opening other roads to evil. Besides that, Allah says in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, that telling to men that do you practice your lust after men in preference to women? That means, Homosexuality is prohibited in Islam, in the Quran, because Almighty God made the human beings. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 21, that He has put love between the hearts of husband and wife. Almighty God has made the human beings in such a way that they love the opposite sex. Generally, naturally, no human being loves the same sex. I'm talking about the love which is required in husband and wife, not the plutonic love, 
which you have between your brothers and between your sisters. Now, initially, there was a research which said that homosexuality is genetic. So during question and answer time, somebody asked me, the way you're asking, if homosexuality is genetic, then how is that human being to blame? It came from his parents, so why is he to blame? Like you're saying, if someone loves someone else, so why should he be blamed? I said this is a research. This is a hypothesis. It's not a fact. And later on we came to know that this hypothesis was wrong and the person who propounded this hypothesis, he himself was a homosexual. So homosexuality is not genetic. It comes, today science tells us, how do homosexuals evolve? Because what Almighty God has given permission for a human being, what's permitted? You get married, do nikah, you can have sex with your wife. And Islam says, that while doing, having sex with your wife is also worshipping Allah. Because you're preventing the haram, you're not going outside the marital bond to satisfy your urges. That's Islam. Today science tells us, today research tells us, that those people who have multiple life partners outside the marriage bond, as compared to those who only have with the spouses, they enjoy their sexual life much better than the others. And what happens today, when you get tired with it, you go to the Western countries, you have mistresses. Five, 10, 20, no problem. You start then doing unnatural things. When you start doing unnatural things, you don't follow the law of the Creator, and you try and satisfy your urges in the wrong way. The moment you keep on doing the wrong way, then you keep on going beyond what is natural, and that's how the person becomes homosexual. It is not genetic, because you go beyond the limits what Almighty God has permitted you. You try other things, you try unnatural things, and finally you land up by saying you, you no longer enjoy having sex with the opposite sex, so you have sex with the same sex. So sister, because they have broken the law of Almighty God and they do unnatural things, that's how psychologically they become a homosexual. So, but naturally, if you break the law of Almighty God, that's totally wrong. And that's how it lands up a person being homosexual. So they are to blame, and Islam prohibits homosexuality. Even Christianity prohibits homosexuality. Most of the religions are against homosexuals. It's now the Western countries are saying, because in democracy, whatever majority says, you win. Majority wins. In Islam, majority doesn't win, the haqq wins. The truth wins. I remember when I'd gone to Canada in 1996, the first time I went to give a lecture, in the front page I saw a man kissing a man. A man kissing a man, and it says, that they have married each other. Today in Western countries, if I speak against homosexuality, it's a crime. It's a crime. So what we realize that previously, previously, all the countries, homosexuality was a crime. Then some Western countries like Canada gave legal sanction to it. Today, most of the Western countries Homosexuality is legal. Even India, the country where I come from, they are thinking. They are thinking to make it legal. So what we realize, what is truth is truth. Majority doesn't win. What is wrong is wrong. And in Islam and most of the major religions of the world, homosexuality is a sin. It's a crime. It will not take you to heaven. It will take you to hell. Hope that answers the question, sister. <laughs> The next question is... Um... As Dr. Zakir mentioned, that was the last question. If you do have another one, you may go to the back and again, ask your next question in a moment. So we'll go to the next question from the brother on the mic on the right-hand side. Uh, brother, the sister says that if you um, prove this last 
question. She will take Shahada. Bring it on. There's this uh, question about, uh, I read it on an atheist article, uh, which said that, um, like when uh, Allah had created the Garden of uh, Eden, he put in Adam and Eve there. And, uh, but because they broke the rule, as in they had the fruit of, uh, I don't know what it is, they had the fruit, uh, which was forbidden. Uh, they were banished from the garden. Uh, they were thrown out. And uh, because of which, it was told that, uh, like, you have to work for your daily bread. You need to work, and only then will you earn to have your uh, daily bread. Likewise, it was also told that uh, women, they would, uh, their pain in pregnancy would increase. It's like, till now, the same thing is happening. We have to work hard, we have to struggle. We have to do everything necessary to earn a daily bread. And uh, the same thing with the women, like, they are dying in pregnancy, their pain is increased. Uh, why is it that uh, if Allah Himself had punished them so badly till date, uh, they are like with the same punishment? How is it that it is an example for others to forgive other people when Allah Himself has not forgiven or guide me right? Sisters asked a very good question. She rightly said that what you're quoting, sister, is about the Bible. What you're saying is mentioned in the Bible that Adam and Eve, may Allah be pleased with them. When they were in the Garden of Eden, they disobeyed the commandment of Almighty God. It's mentioned in the Bible. And it's mentioned in Genesis chapter number 3, verse number 23, that Almighty God punished them and He threw them out of the Garden. And Almighty God says in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 16, that you women, because you have disobeyed God, you shall give birth to children in pain and your desire shall be that of the husband. So according to the Bible, pregnancy is a curse on the woman. This is what you're quoting is the Bible. And I agree with you that how can God not forgive? In Christianity, the full blame in the Bible is put on the woman, Eve, Eve, Eve. May Allah be pleased with her. In Quran, if you read, there is not a single place in the Quran where the blame is put only on Eve. The blame is equally put on Adam and Eve both. May Allah be pleased with them. If you read in the Quran, it's mentioned in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 19 to 27, that Adam and Eve, may Allah be pleased with them, both of them, they disobeyed God. Both of them, they repented, and both were forgiven. The blame is put equally on them. There is not a single verse in the Quran where the blame is only put on Eve. May Allah be pleased with her. But there is a verse in the Quran in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 121, which says that Adam, peace be upon him, he disobeyed God. So there is one verse which speaks only about Adam, peace be upon him, but as a whole, if you analyze, the Quran puts the blame on both of them, Adam and Eve, both of them. May Allah be pleased with them. In the Bible, the blame is only put on women. And because of that, Almighty God says, you shall bear children in pain, and your desire will be that of the husband. So pregnancy, according to the Bible, is a curse. But if you read the Quran, pregnancy is not a curse. Pregnancy uplifts the woman. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 1, respect the womb that bore you. Furthermore, Quran says, in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14, and Surah Akaf, chapter number 46, verse number 15, that we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In travel upon travel did the mother bore you, and in pain did she give you birth. So here we realize that the Quran says that we have to respect your parents, especially your mother. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sai Bukhari, volume number 8, in the book of Adab, Chapter number two, hadith number two, a man approaches Prophet Muhammad and asks him that who deserves the maximum love and companionship in this world? So the Prophet replies, your mother. The man asked after that too. The Prophet again says your mother. The man asked after that too. Again the Prophet says your mother. The man asked after that too. Then for the fourth time the Prophet says your father. That means 75%. Three-fourths of the love and companionship goes to your mother. 25%, one-fourth goes to the father. In short, 
Mother gets the gold medal, she gets the silver medal, as well as the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with the mere consolation prize. <laughs> so these are the teachings of Islam. In Islam, pregnancy uplifts the woman. And I agree with you, once Almighty God has forgiven the human beings, how can you keep on punishing them? So this is the difference between Islam and Christianity, sister. So are you convinced with the answer? Yes, definitely. So do you want to accept Islam now? Yes. Do you believe that there's one God? Yes, I do. Do you believe Jesus is God? No. Do you believe Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger? Yes, I do. Is anyone forcing you to accept Islam? No. Are you doing out of your own free will? Yes. Are you doing out of your own conviction? Yes. Is there anyone giving you a bribe? No. <laughs> so you, inshallah, so it's in Arabic and you can repeat it. Okay. Ashadu. Ashadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Abduhu. Abduhu. Wa rasuluhu. Wa rasuluhu. I bear witness. I bear witness. I bear witness that that there is no God. There is no God. But Allah. But Allah. And I bear witness. And I bear witness that that Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad is is the messenger. The messenger and servant of Allah. And servant of Allah. MashaAllah. You are a Muslim, and I pray to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that to guide you and help you guide your family members also and to give you the best in this world as well as in the next life. And inshallah, grant you Jannah. Next question from the brother's mic. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, Dr. Zak, I appreciate for the decisions I've made. I can already feel the, the welcoming and the love around me. Uh, since Dr. Zak, you are the one who cleared my door. I would like you to kindly give me an Islamic name. <laughs> if I accept Islam, you want me to give you a name? Uh, you can call yourself Bilal. Bilal. Bilal Mashallah. One of the companions of the Prophet, Mashallah. You can call yourself Bilal. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me guide you further and to give you the best in this world and the Akhira and inshallah to grant you Jannah. Thank you very much. So we have a non-Muslim on any of the sisters' mics. We have a non-Muslim. Okay, go ahead, sister. Assalamu alaikum. I'd like to ask if you could shed some light on a verse in the Bible. It's the Old Testament, Solomon, chapter 5. Verse 16, it's the Hebrew text. Hiko mamitikim, wikulo Muhammadim, zidude wazarai baine Jerusalem. I know that in English, Muhammadim has been translated to altogether lovely. What I'd like to ask is why do Christians not know that Muhammad has been spoken about in the Bible? Well, the sisters asked the question. She's given the Hebrew of the verse of the Bible from Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16, which says, Hikko mamitakim vikulli muhammadim zaidudi zairai baina Jerusalem. Which means, sister only translated one word, it means he's most sweet, he's altogether lovely, he's my beloved, he's my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. This is the complete translation of the Hebrew verse she quoted. And when it says, Hikkumamitakim vikulli Muhammadim, Muhammadim in the Semitic languages, when you give respect, you add him to it. Like Allah is for God, Elohim is respect for God. The so same thing to the name Muhammad, they add him and it means, it says Muhammadim. So if you 
read the original text, the name of Muhammad, peace be upon him, is even mentioned in the Bible. Sister is asking, then why don't the Christians believe in Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Sister, you should ask this question to the Christians. I asked this question to hundreds of Christians. Alhamdulillah, some of them accepted Islam. Most of them did not. So I agree with you that the name of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is mentioned in the scriptures of most of the major world religions, including Bible. And as I mentioned earlier, that not only is he mentioned by name, he is even prophesied in various different parts of the Bible. He is prophesied in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 19. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12. In Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16. He's also prophesied in the New Testament. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse number 16. Gospel of John, chapter number 15, verse 26. Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse number 7. Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. In several places, sister. So that's what I asked to the Christians. If it's clearly mentioned about the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then why don't they believe in him? Those Christians who really study and analyze and do research, alhamdulillah, they accept Islam. The others who do not want to accept the truth and say, oh, I've been a Christian for 40 years. Now you want me to change my religion? So they are afraid. Many a time the ego comes in between. Many a time the society comes in between. Many a time, what will my friends tell me? What would my customers tell me? So these things prevent them from accepting the beauty of Islam. What they fail to realize, they wouldn't mind offending their creator just to please their family and their friends. Pleasing our creator is more important than pleasing your family and friends. So those who realize the importance of creator, importance of Almighty God, Alhamdulillah, they accept Islam. Sister, I would like to ask you that are you a Christian or are you a Muslim? I've been studying Islam for about six months. Mashallah. So do you believe now that there is one God? I do. Do you believe Jesus is God? Peace be upon him? No, I don't. Do you believe Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the messenger of God? Yes. Mashallah. So if you believe there is one God, you believe Prophet Muhammad, Messenger of God, and according to me, you are six months of research. Yes. <laughs> Your six months of research have brought you to the truth, sister. Pardon, I didn't hear you. <laughs> Those are tears of joy. Yes. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> when a person realizes the truth, that's what even Quran says, that when people hear the verse, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the moment the believer, tears roll from their eyes. So these are tears of happiness and joy that you have found the truth. As Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of John, seek ye the truth and the truth shall free you. So I believe the truth has freed you today, sister. Your six months of research has brought you to the truth. Sister, would you like to accept Islam? <laughs> sister, would you like to accept Islam? Yes. Is anyone forcing you? Absolutely not. You're doing it out of your own free will? Yes. Inshallah, I say it in Arabic and you can repeat it. Okay. <laughs> Ashadu. Ashadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa ashadu. Ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Abduhu. Abduhu. Wa rasuluhu. I bear witness. I bear witness that there is no God. That there is no God. But Allah. But Allah. And I bear witness. And I bear witness that that Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad is the messenger. That is the messenger. And servant of Allah. And the... Servant of Allah. Servant, servant of Allah. MashaAllah, sister, you're a Muslim. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that as he has guided you, may Allah make you a source to guide the other non-Muslims towards Islam. And I pray to Allah to grant you the best in this world and the akhirah and to grant you Jannah paradise.
inshallah. Do we have any other non-Muslim guests on either the sister's mic or from any of the brother's mics? Yes, we have one here. Go ahead. Uh, she doesn't want to reveal her identity, so I'll be asking her question. Okay. The question is, is it enough to have faith in Allah in your heart alone, or do you have to declare it in public? Sisters asked a very important question. Before I answer the question, I request the non-Muslim brothers and sisters that this is the opportunity, this is the last session of the convention, Dubai International Peace Convention. If you have any question on Islam, on Christianity, on Hinduism, this is the opportunity. Please feel free to come to the microphone. You can ask any question. You can even criticize Quran. I'm young, I can take it. This is the opportunity. This is the last session. Please don't feel shy. Come on the microphone and clarify your doubt. The sister asked a very important question that is it sufficient for a person to have faith in Almighty God and believe in Him, or should he or she declare it? Sister, the most important criteria is that that person should have faith in Almighty God. Declaring in public or to others is not compulsory. If the sister feels that there is danger to her life, she may have problems, or maybe society would harm her. In this case, having faith in the heart is sufficient. But if there is no danger to life, no danger to that person, declaring is better because then that person can follow Islam freely. Because if you have faith and you hide it from others, then you have to practice Islam secretly, that becomes difficult. So if you really fear your life, or you fear that somebody will harm you, then declaring is not a fard, it's not compulsory. But if there is no such problem, declaring is better, because you can practice your faith openly, and you need not practice it secretly. Hope that answers the question, sister. Thank you. Do we have any more of our non-Muslim guests on any of the mics? Yes, go ahead. I request the coordinator, Brother Musa, that please ask one at a time. What we said earlier, first microphone, then second, then third, then fourth. Go in order, otherwise there'll be chaos. Anyone coming on the microphones, I request you to go in order. First microphone from Jain, second microphone, third from ladies, fourth, again come to first. Because I feel that we should do justice. That non-Muslim brother was waiting for a long time. So let's be just and go in the order as per the rules of the session. Yes, brother. Your name yeah. and profession. Um, yeah. Hi. My name is Ahmed. I come from the glorious country of Iraq. And uh, I'm a born Muslim. My problem is that um, I practice Islam when I was... Brother, first we request questions from the non-Muslims. Once yeah. all the questions from non-Muslims are over, inshallah, we'll give you a chance. Yeah, but I'm telling you my problem only. It's... it's Okay. But, but you said you are Ahmed and you are a born Muslim. I am born Muslim. But now are you a Muslim or not? I'm agnostic. Oh, so now you have left the religion of Islam. Yeah, I'm confused. Okay, fine. If you have left the religion of Islam, you can ask the question, brother. Okay. So my question is, how come I don't have the faith that you and the other Muslims have and some of my friends, even though I practiced Islam a lot and I even did Amrah? But I still do most of the sins that uh, are forbidden in Islam, and I sometimes am lazy to do the prayer and the other um, subjects we have to do in Islam. I have read many books and about other religions and conspiracy theories and documentaries and such. I even have seen your own videos in YouTube, and there are many questions that go around my head about um, Allah and the Messenger and Muslims in general. And basically, the, the most important question is, um, you said in one of your debates or questions that Allah is the creator and he's uncreated. But I have realized how can the uncreated exist and if he exists, um, how can we notice him? How can we see him or hear him or feel him or know of his existence if he's uncreated in our own dimension or so? That's one of the questions. Brother Ahmed said that he is a born Muslim, he comes from Iraq. He read the Quran, he read the books. 
but he commits many sins. He believes maybe sometimes he's agnostic and he's lazy for praying. Brother, before I answer your main question, if you do sins and if you're lazy for praying, that does not make you a non-Muslim. As long as you believe that praying is fard, sometimes you miss, it's a sin. It's a major sin that you sometimes don't pray, but that doesn't make you a non-Muslim. If you say praying is not required, then you're doing kufr. But if sometimes you do sin, sometimes minor sin, sometimes major sin, it is haram, it's forbidden, but that does not throw you outside the fold of Islam. There are sometimes vasas of the shaitan asking you, oh, you're a Muslim, but this is wrong in Islam, this is wrong, and it does deviate the person's mind. At that time, maybe your iman may be low, but these things should not make you consider that you're non-Muslim. Regarding a question that I mentioned in my speech, and you're right, that Almighty God is the creator, but he himself is uncreated. You ask the question, how can the uncreated, how can we see the uncreated, and how it's possible? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is khaliq, is the creator. And by definition, He's uncreated. Because normally people say that when they try and prove in logic that everything has a creator, who created this table, the carpenter, from where he got, from the tree, who created the tree, so it goes back to Allah. So when many of the people try to convince an atheist, they try and say that everything has a creator, and then they get trapped when the atheist asked him who created Allah. So if you hear my tapes, I never go that way. I ask the atheist that how did you come to know about the universe? How did you come to know about the functioning of the stars, of the sun? And he says, and goes back, that the creator. So it's the vice versa. So if you know how to deal with logic, you don't trip over this problem with the atheist trap, the Muslims or the believers, by saying, who created Allah? By definition, Allah is uncreated. And if you ask the question, who created Allah? If you have heard my tapes, I give the reply. That suppose a person comes and says that my brother John. Yeah, I know, I saw that, I heard that's funny, but I mean, how does he exist if he's uncreated? Not um, That is Allah. Uncreated. Yeah. How that's the exist? difference between you and Allah. How does he exist mean? He was existing from, he doesn't have a beginning. You and I have a beginning, that's human being. So that is the difference between us and Allah. You can't say that Allah has to be like us. If Allah is like you and me, why should we worship him? I see, but um, have you heard of the phenomenon, the Big Brother, used by various orders and political agendas to control the people and such by implementing it into multiple gods, and then later on it became a monotheistic religion all over the world to make it easier Big for the Brother, people sorry, to... I've never heard of the religion Big Brother. It's not a religion. It's um, like an, a theory, an idea, basically. For what does it say? Yes? What does this idea say? What does it say? Is that when you have a big brother, it's easier for you to live life. When you have someone watching you the whole time, understanding you the whole time, protecting you the whole time, being with you the whole time, and you can talk to him, although he never talks to you back, maybe in your dreams, do it to your mind and such, it's easier for you to live. While a human who does not have a big brother and is not easily controlled into doing so and is having complete freedom is a danger for the major ruling powers and such. What does it say? I don't understand. Big brother may be there, big brother may not be there. What does, it, what does it have to do with Islam and God? What does it have to do? Because basically Allah is watching you the whole time. He so you want to say that Allah is like a big brother? Indeed. You use him for your protection so you won't be scared. You know what I mean? See, this is the hypothesis. Hypothesis. If you have heard, how do I convince an atheist, if you have heard my answer that you said that you're agnostic, you're atheist. Yeah. So first thing I do to an atheist is I congratulate him. What? I congratulate him. Okay. Have you heard my answer of atheist? Yeah, you congratulate him and stuff. But I haven't seen your debates with the atheist. I just saw your answers on some questions. Fine, so you haven't seen the answer of atheist? No, but I've seen your debate with David William Campbell. And that David William Campbell is not an atheist. Yeah, yeah. Now, when an atheist tells me he does not believe in God like your theory of Big Brother, 
Yeah. And if you believe in that theory, I will ask you, first thing I do to the atheist, I congratulate him. You know why? Yeah, because they think and they don't follow what their parent does and such stuff like that. No, no. I congratulate him because he is not doing blind belief. The other people are doing blind belief. He is a Christian because father is a Christian. He is a Hindu because father yeah, exactly. is a Hindu. Most of the Muslims are Muslim because father is a Muslim. He is thinking. He says there is no God. He has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La Ilaha. The reason I congratulate him is because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, Islamic creed, La Ilaha. The only thing I have to do is Illa Allah, which I shall do, Inshallah. Mm. So if you have heard my answer, an atheist becomes an atheist because he believes in science, he believes in logic. So I ask him that if an equipment is bought in front of him, which no one in the world has ever seen, and if the question is asked, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this new equipment? What is the answer? Of course, he's going to tell you the producer or the maker of this equipment. Creator, producer, maker. So when we ask him questions that how did this universe come into existence, he will talk about the Big Bang. This what we're going to talk is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. Avalam yaral lazina kafaru, anna samavati wal arda, kaan tarat kumftak nauma. Do not the unbelievers see that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we closed them asunder. This what you came to know 50 years back is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned that? Well, in various civilizations, in like 2000 or 5000 BC, before Islam came or Christianity itself, there was various civilizations that are good in astronomy and they know more about our solar system than we do now, sadly. Brother, brother, of... brother, your knowledge of science is little, not in-depth. I do agree. There are certain things which were known as hypothesis. For example, for example, we came to know we were proved that the earth was spherical in 1577. I know that in 6th century BC, there were Pythagoras who believed that the earth was spherical. But the same Pythagoras who believed the earth was spherical also believed that the earth was the center of the universe, which is wrong. You show me one civilization which believes 100% what the Quran has mentioned. I challenge you. What you say, so do you mean to say there was a person who said, okay, this civilization, out of 100 things, these two things are right. Out of 100 things, these five things are right. Out of this 100, and pick 10 choose. Who can do that? No one besides the creator. Even if you know that there were 10 different civilizations, hundreds of civilizations, there is not a single civilization that you know in the past which knew 100% of science what we know today. So where is your logic? Where is your theory? I do know that certain things were hypothesis, which were proved later on. But there is not a single civilization which knows everything what is mentioned in the Quran. So the answer goes back to the original question, who could have collected this in the Quran? Someone 1400 years back, could he do and say, okay, out of these 100 things, these three are right. Out of these 100 things, these two are right. Out of this, it's not possible. <laughs> Mathematically, it's not possible. Well, you never gave the idea of extraterrestrials or so. I mean, knowledge is power, and... Brother, I'm asking you a simple question. We are not coming here to have a debate. Yeah. I'm asking you a question. Point out a single civilization. You're asking something else. Yeah, We are right. not here to discuss. You can come in the room and discuss. You ask a question, I'm giving you the answer. You gave about old civilization. I told you, you're right. But out of 100 things, 98, they were wrong. So. I'm asking you, who could have mentioned this in the Quran? You're talking something else now. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm asking a simple question, 2 plus 2 equals how much? You're saying, I'm telling you 3 multiplied by 3 is how much? I'm asking a name, you're telling that, where do you live? You know, I'm you're... asking a simple question, name me a single civilization which has everything what was mentioned in the Quran. Do you know of any or not? Yes or no? Well, not everything, of course. Even not 10%? Why? Babylon knows of some, most of the planets and such. Planet is not the only thing mentioned in the Quran. There of are course. thousand things mentioned in the Quran. To say what thousand things are mentioned in the Quran, 10% would be equal to 100 things. Did Babylonian civilization knew about 100 things mentioned in the Quran? No, because they you does, cannot. Have the they knew the five or six things. In percentage wise, very small. So of course. Who can be the author of the Quran besides the creator to know what is right, what is wrong? Today, science has established 
the hypothesis mentioned by Babylonian so many centuries back is today proven. So these were hypotheses in the past, which out of them, many have been rejected, some have been accepted. So to collect all, which is 100% correct, has to be from the creator and no one else. Hope that answers the question. Yeah. Do we have a non-Muslim on the brother's mic on the right-hand side? Um, yeah, brother one. Go ahead. Good evening. I'm Mahesh. I born in 1979. Maybe I'll be here up to my death, maybe 2030 or 40 if the world exists. I just want to know where I was before 1979 where I'll be after my death. If I, I have been meant to be here in this world for this certain period, who am I representing? The Buddha asked the question that he was born in 1979, and today he's in UAE. He wants to know where will he be afterwards. He will be saying, most probably be here till 2030 if the world exists. Where will he be after he dies? And who are you representing? Brother, you are representing your own self. If you have not manipulated or done some makeup or trying to hide, if you are your own self, you are representing yourself. Point number one. Where will you be after you die? Depending upon what are you following. If you follow the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran, after you die, you will be in heaven. If you go against the laws of the Creator, Again, the last and final revelation, the Quran, then after you die, you will be in hell. So I don't know if you accept the commandments of Almighty God today, what you did between 1979 and till the 14th of April 2012, all will be forgiven. All forgiven, zero will be forgiven. So in the past, whatever you have done in the past will be forgiven because our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, the moment a person accepts Islam, all his previous sins are washed away. So depending upon whether you follow the laws of the Creator, where will you be, I can tell you. But you don't know when will you die. If you say, if that is the case, you know what I'll do? Maybe I'll live till 2030, so I'll accept Islam in 2029. Brother, you don't know, even I don't know, how long will you live? And you rightly said, if the world exists. I don't know till how long will the world exist. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 34, no one besides Allah knows the hour, when will the earth end? We don't know. Whether it will stay for a few years, for a few decades, we don't know. How long will you live and I live, I don't know. So the best is the moment you come to know the truth. Accept it. All the past sins will be forgiven. Then you try and practice and follow as much as you can. So where will you be after you die depends upon you. I can only guide you. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Ghashia, chapter number 88, verse number 21-22, Allah says, فَذَكِّرِ نَمَانْتَ مُذَكِّرِ he tells the Prophet, your job is to deliver the message. Giving hidayah is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I want to ask you, brother, after you die, do you want to go to heaven or hell? After you die, do you want to go to heaven or hell? To be frank, I don't know. You don't know? Because for me, the heaven and hell is here. It's up to us. Yes, this is temporary heaven hell, you know? Temporary. As I mentioned earlier, Quran says in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allazi khalaq al mawta wal hayata. It is Allah who has given you death and life so that he may test which of you is good in deeds. This is a test. And an average man lives in this world for about 70 years, 60 years. Some die at the age of 20, some 50, some live for 100 years. Average maybe 60 to 70 years. So this is temporary phase. The next life is eternal. So you say heaven and hell is here. And then if you try to make this life heaven, by going after luxury, enjoying life, drinking alcohol, your next life becomes hell. Because Quran, Allah says in Surah Hud, that those who want this world, Allah will give you this world, but will not give you in the next life. Those who care for next life, 
Allah will give you next life, also this life. So as a businessman, if someone tells you that I will give you a little trouble, difficulty for the 70 years, next life eternal, unending, always pleasure. So this life is 0.0001% of the next life. As a businessman, you wouldn't mind saying, okay, I don't mind trouble in this couple of, you know, small percentage. You know, like before the examination, you struggle, you stay awake, you don't sleep, or you sleep less, and then you appear for the examination. So that, that few days before that you struggle and you study, so that in future it is good for you. So similarly, brother, this life is a test for the hereafter. If you're a Hindu, if you're Mahesh, and if you believe in the Hindu scriptures, same the Veda says. If you read Rig Ved, book number 10, chapter number 16, verse number 4 to 5, talks about Punar Janam. Punar means next, Janam means life. Same thing what the Quran says about next life. So this life you come, and there's next life. Being born, dying, born, dying, cycle of birth, rebirth is not mentioned in the Vedas. It talks about Punar Janam means next life, which is there in the Quran. So a really good person would think about, as a better businessman, that the next life is multiple times. Multiple, keep on multiplying. This life is a small, small, negligible point, 0.001% compared to the next life. So as an intelligent person, you wouldn't mind taking trouble in this life so that your next life becomes paradise and heaven. So, brother, would you like in the next life to go to heaven or hell? Brother? Yes, sir. Would you like to go in the next life into heaven or hell? No, sir. Uh, I don't think I will be having a next life because if I am having, if I am going to have a next life... Do you believe in the Hindu scriptures? Yes, sir. Do you believe? Do Not you believe in the, the Vedas? scriptures, some of the points. Do you believe in the Vedas? Yes. I don't know big about the Vedas. But you believe it to be sacred, correct? Sorry? Do you believe it to be from God? No, I feel I am God. You are God. Good. All are God. Your... It, that's what Hinduism says. Aham Brahmasmi. What is, the def of... what is the definition of God? What is the definition? I don't know. I... I am God, you are God, what is the definition of God? I don't know. That means you are don't know, I am don't know. <laughs> I know myself. Okay. You say you are God, I am God. We what are all a part of God. I am asking you what is the definition of God and you say I don't know. Are you talking English or what? I am talking English. So what is the definition of God? I cannot define, sir. just I can feel. So without defining you are saying you are God and I am God. But I can realize, sir, what God is, is everywhere in all of us. What is God. the definition of God? Then I will say whether God is everywhere, you are God or not. First, give me the definition of God. If your definition of God is only wrong, I said, this is not God what I'm talking about. What is the definition of God? I don't know to define, sir, exactly in words. So that means you do not believe. I'm not talking about the God which you're talking about. So you should ask me what is the definition when I have to tell you. Yes, sir. Can you explain me? If you don't know what you should do, you should ask or not? Yes. So ask me, I will tell you. <laughs> the definition of God comes to according to Vedas and Upanishad, then I come to the Quran. If you read the Upanishad, Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number six, section number two, verse number one, Ikkam evidityam. God is only one without a second. It's mentioned Sveta Sethar Upanishad, chapter number six, verse number nine. Na chasya kasij janita na chadipa. A Sanskrit quotation which says that of that God, he has got no superior, he has got no parents. Almighty God has got no Lord, no superior, no mother, no father. It's mentioned Sveta Sethar Upanishad, chapter number four, verse number 19. Na tasya pratima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima. Pratiba is a Sanskrit word which means image, picture, portrait, sculpture, statue. Nathya Asti. Of that God, there is no image, 
no picture, no portrait, no painting, no photograph, no idol, no statue, no sculpture. Same thing is repeated. In Yajurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, Na Tasrapati Masti, of that God, there is no image, there is no picture, there is no portrait, there is no photograph, no sculpture. Furthermore, it says, in the Brahma Sutra of Hinduism, Ekam Braham Dyotya Naste, Nina Naste Kinchan. There is only one God, not a second one, not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So based on this definition, God is one, there's nothing like him. And the Quran further says in Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, the definition of God is, Qul Huallahu Ahad, say it's Allah one and only, Allah Samad. Allah the absolute eternal. Lam milad wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. Walam yakul lahu kufanat. There's nothing like him. Kul wallahu wad. Say he's Allah one and only. Are you the only human being? Am I the only human being? Yes or no? Yes, yes. or no? I'm a human being. Are you the only human being? Only one? No, no, no. No. I'm one of the. Kul wallahu ad. Say he's Allah one and only. Allah who summat, the absolute and eternal. Are you absolute and eternal? Are you absolute and eternal? No. So how can you be God? I am not absolute and eternal. How can I be God? He begets no noisy begotten. Are you begotten? Were you born? Were you born or not? Yeah. So how can you be God? Even I was born, how can I be God? Do you beget? I have begotten, I have got children. Do you have children? Yes. How can you be God? There's no, nothing like him. I, what I'm saying that is means I, your definition of God. Forget what you say about God. I'm talking about my definition of God. Forget what you say about God now. Keep it. That may be God with a small g. I'm not talking about God with a small g, what you're talking about. I'm talking about God with a capital G. He's only one. He's all-powerful, he's absolute, he begets not, nor is he begotten, there's nothing unto like him. Based on this definition, can you call yourself God? Can I call myself God? If you wish, you can. <laughs> I asked you the question, are you born? You're saying yes. If you wish, then you'll be called a lunatic. No, sir, what I'm feeling is what I'm a I... part of the God. You were saying the only one God, no? I feel I am the part of it. The big one. We all are part of it. Maybe we got detached, as like this that world is, got detached from the sun. That is your definition of God. That's not the definition of God of Vedas. It's not the definition of God of Quran. So therefore, I say this God is a different God. I'm not talking about the God that you believe in. I'm talking about the God which I believe in. He's one. He's not part of everything. Your God, forget about it. Keep it at the side now. Fine? The God, what you're talking keep it at the side. I'm talking about the definition of my God. You understand? He's only one. He's all powerful. Are you all powerful? Are you all powerful? Not all powerful. So you are not the God I'm talking about. What God you're talking about, keep that God aside. Okay. Okay? My God I'm talking about. Therefore, la ilaha, there is no God. All the other false gods are wrong. You keep it aside. I'm talking about the correct definition. Someone is talking about 2 plus 3 is equal to 5. That equation, keep it at the side. The God that I'm talking about, the entity I'm talking about, He is one. He is all-powerful. He is absolute. He begets not, nor is He begotten. He is not born. He does not give birth to anyone. And there's nothing like Him. He's only one. Do you believe in such a God? No, sir, I don't believe. That's the problem. That means you are not believing in the true God. My request to you is, you read your Hindu scriptures, all the quotation I gave, go and read the translation no, of sir, the Quran, I try am... and find out the true God, not the fake God. I am God, you are God. I don't consider myself God. You are calling me God, so I'll say, yes, I'm God. I am not a fool to accept you that I am God. You want to go to hell, go. I don't want, I don't want you to take me to hell. I'm going to go to heaven. I want to take you to heaven. But to take you to heaven, if I agree with you that you're God and I'm God, we both will go to hell. I prefer we both go to heaven. Therefore, I request you read your scripture, the Vedas, 
the Upanishad, read the Quran, educate yourself, and join me. We both will go to heaven, inshallah. Thank you. Now, just a short announcement. Uh, the organizers had uh, asked us to finish now as it's 12.30. However, I feel that Dr. Zakir uh, would want to continue a little bit longer. Uh, Dr. Zakir, would you like to continue? Okay, so we're going to disobey the organizers for your pleasure, inshallah, because I'm sure that you want to hear a bit more. I hope that they can forgive us. Do we have a non-Muslim on the sister's mic on the right-hand side? Yes, sister. Do we have a non-Muslim there? She's a reverted Muslim and she has a question to ask about her non-Muslim parents. Okay, we'll allow it. Go ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to ask that how can I give dawah to my parents that they start believing Islam, believe in Allah, believe in the day of judgment. Anyhow, I want to convince them that Islam is the best and without Islam, nothing is in life. I want to save them from the fire of hell. Please, please suggest me how, how can I suggest? Okay. Sister, what religion do your parents follow? Hindu. The Hindus. Sister, my request to you is, before I answer this question, as Brother Musa said, in Islam, we have to follow the Amir. So the chairman of the organizing committee has given permission to forget about the other organizers. So when Dr. Ahmed Shebani has given us permission, the lower committee don't follow. In Islam, we follow the Amir. So we go ahead and inshallah, till the non-Muslims are there, we continue. The sister asked the question that how will she be able to help her parents who are Hindu to get them towards Islam, which she believes is the true religion. Sister, one of the master keys for doing dawah, according to me in the Quran, is Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, which says, Tala vila kalimatin sawa im bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first time, Allah nabuda illallah, that we worship none but Allah. So my request to you would be that you can take my DVD, and I've given a talk on similarities between Islam and Hinduism. Based on this DVD, you will never hurt your parents. Because this DVD is based on the verse of the Quran that come to common terms. And inshallah, once you show this DVD, if they are logical, if they are truthful, inshallah, Allah will also guide them to the true part. Please My, again say DVD name, please. The name of the DVD is Similarities Between Hinduism and Islam. The other DVD is also there. There are hundreds of my DVDs. You can select some of them. There's a debate I had with Shishi Ravi Shankar on concept of God in Islam and Hinduism in the light of the sacred scriptures. Even that is good. There are other DVDs like Universal Brotherhood, which talk about Hinduism also. My request to you would be ask them to see this DVD. And I would request you that when you meet with your parents, love them more, respect them more, follow everything what they say, except if they tell you to do something which is against Quran and Sahih Hadith, which is against Allah and His Rasul. Anything else, you follow them. And I always tell the reverse. That suppose they tell you to do something which you did not like, but it is not haram in Islam. For example, they used to tell you that wear this blue color dress. You say, no, mother, I don't like blue color. Now, once you accept Islam, wearing blue is not haram. So you tell your mother, because you are my mother, you are telling me to wear blue. Though I don't like blue, I will wear blue. So your mother should realize that after my daughter has become a Muslim, she's respecting me more, she's obeying me more. Only those things, what they ask you to do, which is against Allah and His Rasul, against Quran and Sahih Hadith, you don't follow, everything else you follow. The moment they see the change, that my daughter is loving me more, she's respecting me more, she's caring for me more, she's taking more care of me. There should be a difference. That's why I want 
I will call my parents here, visit after one or two months after, and I will make so much khidmat. Hope my parents. <laughs> Inshallah. Inshallah, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he make you the zariya to get your parents on the straight path. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Inshallah, may Allah give hidayah to both your parents. Inshallah. I have one message for here present all non-Muslim brother and sister. Please accept the Islam. Believe in Allah. Because I know, I know better. <laughs> Without Islam, life is nothing. Without worshipping Allah, life is nothing. You are like a dead people. Please accept the Islam. Islam is gold. Please accept this gold. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. May Allah bless you and protect you, dear sister. To the brothers, mic on the left-hand side, do we have any non-Muslims? My name is Joseph. I have two questions to ask. Why all the Muslims men are allowed to marry for four women? And the second one is, how can you prove that Jesus was not crucified? Brother, there's two questions. Brother, are you a Christian? I am. Brother, there's two questions. That why does Islam permit a man to have up to four wives? Why does Islam permit a man to have more than one wife? And second question, how can you prove that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucified? that Quran is the only religious book on the face of the earth which says marry only one. You read the Bible, you read the Ramayana, you read the Mahabharata, you read the Veda. No religious book on the face of the earth says marry only one besides the Quran. If you read Ramayana, the Hindu scriptures, the father of Sri Ram, he had more than one wife. If you read Mahabharata, Sri Krishna, how many wives he had? Four, ten, thousand, ten thousand. He had 16,108 wives. So if Sri Krishna, can have 16,108 wives. So why can't Muslims have maximum up to four? If you read the Old Testament, it says that Solomon, peace be upon him, had 700 wives. Abraham, peace be upon him, had three wives. So Old Testament tells you can marry as many wives as you want. Same as the New Testament says that you should follow Old Testament. So in Hinduism, in Christianity, in Judaism, you can marry as many as you want. It is later on that the church put a restriction that Christians should marry only one. It is later on, Rabbi Ben Shemgen Yehuda passed a sign on and say that Jews should marry only one. Otherwise, previously, they used to marry as many as they wished. It is the Indian Penal Code in India in 1954 that put a restriction and said under the Hindu Special Marriage Act, the Hindus should marry only one. But the scriptures put no restrictions. Let's analyze what does the Quran say. Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 3, marry women of your choice in twos, threes, or fours, but if you can't do justice, marry only one. This statement, if you can't do justice, marry only one, is only given in the Quran and no other religious scriptures. Let us analyze why does Quran give permission for the Muslim men to marry more than one woman, maximum four. The reason is that by nature, Male and female are born in equal proportion. But if you ask any pediatrician, he will tell you, the doctor of the children, that the female child is stronger than the male child in fighting germs and diseases. So you have more deaths among the male children as compared to female children. So in pediatric age itself, the females are more than the males. As life goes on, there is death due to wars, due to alcoholism, due to drug addiction, due to accident, in all these cases, more men are dying as compared to females. So today in the world, there are more females as compared to males. In few countries, like India and China, the female population is less than the male population because of female feticide and female infanticide. In India, according to a BBC report, every day, more than a thousand fetuses are being aborted after the identified as females. If you multiply this figure by 365, you get a total of more than a million fetuses are being aborted every year in India after they identify that they're females. According to the Tamil Nadu Government Hospital report, out of 10 females born alive, four are put to death. If you stop this evil practice of female feticide and female infanticide in India, even in India, the female population will become more than the male population. Even in China, 
If you stop this evil practice, the female population will become more than the male population. Today, if you analyze, in USA alone, there are 4.7 million females more than males. In UK alone, there are 1.2 million females more than males. In Germany alone, there are 1.6 million females more than males. In Russia alone, there are 10.6 million females more than males. And God alone knows that how many females are more than males throughout the world. If I agree with you that one man should only marry one woman, and suppose your sister happens to live in America, or suppose my sister happens to live in USA, and the market is saturated, every man has found a wife for himself, yet there will be 4.7 million females who will not find life partner. And if your sister happens to be one of them, or if my sister happens to be one of the 4.7 million females who have not found a life partner for themselves, the only option for them is that she either marries a man who already has a wife or becomes public property. Public property, such a harsh word. It is the most sophisticated word I can use. I cannot use a better word. You know, in America, today the statistics tell us, on average, a man has eight different sexual partners before he settles down with one. Having mistresses in USA is very common. Five, 10, 20, 30, no problem. Having more than one legal wife, it doesn't go down their throat. When a woman is a mistress, she doesn't get her rights. She's dishonored. She's not treated well. In Islam, when a woman becomes the second wife, she gets her honor, she gets her right, she's treated well. Any modest woman, if you ask her, that would you prefer being a second wife of a man who's already married or become public property, they would opt for the first. So Islam has given permission for some men to have more than one wife to protect the modesty of the woman. Coming to your second question. Is it allowed for ladies to marry four men? Brother, you're asking counter question. The time is limited. You asked two questions, now you're asking a third question. Are you convinced with the first answer? I'm convinced with the first one. MashaAllah. So you're convinced. OK. The brother asked that, is a woman allowed to have more than one husband? If you do that, this problem will be exaggerated I mean, more. I mean in Muslims. In, in Muslims. As it is, women are more than men. If women marry more than one husband, the problem will be exaggerated. Point number one. Point number two, if a man has more than one wife and if the child is born, you can easily identify who is the father, who is the mother. If a woman has more than one husband and if the child is born... The DNA is still alone. Brother, let me finish the answer, na? You asked the question, was I interfering? Was I interrupting? Yes or no? No. No, so why are you interrupting? After I finish, you can ask, na? I'm a medical doctor. Are you a medical doctor? No. I'm a medical doctor. I know about DNA testing. I'll come to it. Once, if a woman has more than one husband, two husbands, and if a child is born, and if he goes to admit in the school, and if the question, who's your father, she'll have to give two names. <laughs> You're talking about DNA testing. I know about it. DNA testing is recent. Was DNA testing there 50 years back? Was it there? No, it's a new recent discovery, yet it's not 100%. Even if I agree it's 100%, it is now, it wasn't there before. Islam is there since time immemorial. And this is not the only reason. Even if I agree tomorrow it becomes 100% perfect, this is not the only reason. Today science tells us that man is more polygamous in nature as compared to the female. Today science tells us that during menstrual cycle, the female undergoes certain psychological changes. It's not possible for her to do the role of multiple wives. But a man doesn't undergo these changes. It's possible for him to do a role of multiple husbands. Today, science tells us that if a man has multiple sexual partners and all are faithful, there is no problem. But if a female has multiple sexual partners and all are faithful, there are chances of sexually transmitted diseases to emerge. And that disease will go back to the male partner. So medically, it is not acceptable that a female has multiple partners, but medically and scientifically, it's acceptable that a male can have multiple partners. <laughs> Coming to your second question, that how can I prove that Jesus wasn't crucified, peace be upon him? 
The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, 157, they killed him not, neither did they crucify him, it was only made to appear so. So Quran is clear, Wama katalu, wama salabu. They killed him not, neither did they crucify him. If I have to prove to... Are you a Christian, brother? I am. If you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the Bible in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 38. When people come to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and tell him that, Oh, Master, show us some signs. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, replies, E evil and adulterous generation, seek it thee after a sign, no sign shall be shown to you except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Brother, do you know the story of Jonah? Jonah, Jonah. I do. Do you know? Now, Almighty God tells Jonah that go to Nineveh. Jonah being a prophet of God, he says the people of Nineveh, they will not understand, they will not listen to me. He goes to Joppa. It uses going to Nineveh. So while he's going in the ship, in a boat to Joppa, there's a storm that comes into the sea. This is mentioned in the book of Jonah. Book of Jonah, less than two pages. At that time, there was a superstition that the storm in the sea is due to some person not obeying the commandment of the master. So Jonah being a prophet of God, he volunteers. I'm the one who is disobeying my master. And at that time, it was a superstition that if you throw the person in the water, the water will become calm. So Jonah volunteers. I am disobeying my master, throw me overboard. I am asking you the question, when Jonah was thrown overboard, was he dead or alive? Jonah, when he was thrown overboard into the sea, when the storm comes, was Jonah dead or alive? He was he's alive, alive. Alive, very good. When a person is thrown in the sea, where there is a storm, a person ought to die. Was Jonah dead or alive when he was thrown in the sea? He was alive. Alive. If he dies, no miracle. At storm, a normal person dies. He's alive, it's a miracle. A fish comes and gobbles him up. A fish comes and swallows him up. When the fish swallows him up, was Jonah dead or alive? Alive. Alive. Three days and three nights, the fish takes him around the sea. In the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, Jonah prays to Almighty God. While he was in the belly of the fish, was Jonah dead or alive? Alive. Alive, 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 alive. The fish vomits him out. Jonah comes onto the show. Was he dead or alive? Alive. 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 Alive, 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 alive. Miracle of a miracle of a miracle of a miracle. I'm asking you the question, when Jesus Christ peace be upon him, according to the Bible, when he was taken down from the cross, he was put in the grave, in the sepulcher. In the sepulcher, was Jesus dead or alive? Was dead. 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 If he's dead, does he fulfill the sign or not? But he was raised to birth. In the sepulchre, in the grave, was he dead or alive? Dead. Dead or alive? Dead. If he was dead, is he fulfilling the prophecy? Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, No sign shall be given to you except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. If Jonah was alive, for Jesus Christ to fulfill the prophecy, peace be upon him, he should be dead or alive? Dead or alive, he should be. He should be alive. He should be alive, and he was alive. Why do you say he was dead? Are you trying to say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, lied? If you say he was dead, that means you are saying Jesus was a liar, Nausbillah. That means Jesus was alive. What has been told to you by the church is wrong. Do you believe in the church or do you believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him? But the Bible says Jesus was dead. Where does it say? Give me the reference. I'm not, a, not that much known by But Bible. do you know the sign of Jonah, yes or no? Yeah. Was Jonah dead or alive in the belly of the fish? He was alive. So Jesus Christ has to be dead or alive in the earth. But why it is not mentioned in the Bible that he was alive in the... It is mentioned. Where does it say he was dead? It was assumed the Roman soldiers thought he was dead. They poked a spear. They poked a spear, but he was alive. So if you see my video cassette, Was Christ Crucified? There are umpteen numbers of proofs. I gave you one proof. 
Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not say that, you know, I gave life to the dead, therefore I am a man of God. He put all his eggs in one basket. As Jonah was dead or alive, you are saying Jonah was alive, peace be upon him. So Jesus also, peace be upon him, has to be alive. Why do you say he's dead? Just because the priest told you. So do you believe more in the priest or do you believe in the Bible? I believe in the Bible. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, or the priest? I do believe in Jesus. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, As Jonah was in the belly of the fish, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. So Jonah was dead or alive? Jonah was alive. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, has to be dead or alive? So the Bible still says he was dead and he raised back to life. Where does the Bible say? I have to find it. But what I'm telling you, Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 38. You know the sign of Jonah, no? I do. That time you were dead or alive? Alive. So when you know the sign of Jonah and you don't know where it is said he's dead, you have to follow what is in red letter. There are many things which are mentioned by Paul, which is not part of the sayings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. If you know there is something like a red letter Bible, red letter Bible means whatever Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said is in red ink. If you quote me something in black ink, I will not believe. Why? That is not the word of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Do you give more preference to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, or St. Paul? Jesus Christ. What I'm quoting to you is in red. Gospel of Matthew, note it down. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 38. So don't get me a quotation of back ink. To prove this wrong, you have to get me a quotation in red ink. That's what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said. I request you to go home, read the Bible, and when you're convinced, inshallah, come to the truth. Thank you. Are there any non-Muslims on any of the mics at the moment? Okay, go ahead, brother. Assalamu alaikum. One of my friends want to ask you this question. Is there any line or word which mentioned in Quran about Hinduism, like Jews and Christian? The brother asked the question that, is there any verse in the Quran which speaks about Hinduism like it speaks about Judaism and Christianity? I don't know of any verse. There's no verse in the Quran which specifically mentions about Hinduism, like it does about Christianity and about Judaism. But Quran says in Surah Rad, chapter number 13, verse number 38, Quran says, in every age, every center revelation. By name, only four revelations are mentioned in the Quran. Torah, Zabur, Injil, and the Quran. Torah is the Wahi, the revelation given to Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the Wahi, the revelation given to David, peace be upon him. Injil is the Wahi, the revelation given to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And Quran is the Wahi, the revelation given to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But there were many other revelations besides these four books. For example, Sufi Ibrahim. If you ask me, can you consider Veda the word of God? I say, I don't know. Because there's no verse in the Quran which says Veda was a revelation from God. There's no hadith of the Prophet which says Veda is the word of God. So what I say, maybe it is, maybe it is not. I don't know. I'm not saying for sure it is. But even if it was the word of God, even if it was the word of God, all the revelations that came before the Quran, they were meant for a particular group of people and the message was to be followed till the next revelation came. So even if Veda was the word of God, it was meant only for those people and for that time. But Quran, since it's the last and final revelation from Almighty God, it was not meant only for the Muslims or the Arabs, it was meant for the whole of humanity. And since it was the last revelation, and no other revelation will come, it is to be followed till the last day of judgment. So based on this, even if you agree Veda was the word of God, hypothetically, it was meant for those people and for that time. Today, all the human beings in the world, whether they're living in India, or UAE, or Pakistan, or Saudi Arabia, or USA, or Canada, or UK, they should follow the last and final revelation of God, the glorious Quran, and last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, just to confirm again, do we have any non-Muslim guests on any of the microphones? Okay, go ahead, brother. Uh, good evening to Dr. Zayek and everybody present here. Uh, before I say anything, I just want to say that whatever I'm asking, I do not mean any disrespect to anybody and to anyone. Uh, I'm a very young person, so please excuse me if I say anything inappropriate. 
My question is, uh, since as, as far as I've heard and know, and I've seen around me that Islam does not believe in idol worship. So I want to know what are the reasons for non believe in idol worship? That's my first question. The brother asked the question that as far as he believes that Islam does not believe in idol worship, why Islam doesn't believe in idol worship? The reason Islam doesn't believe in idol worship is because it is prohibited. Point number one, you cannot make idol of God. The moment you make an idol of God, you are degrading God. Imagine you make idol and suppose the idol falls. What happens to the idol? The idol breaks. If the idol cannot help itself, how can it help me? Sir, uh, but my point here is that if there's an idol of God, it might not be the actual actual God that we, that actually exists. But if it helps me in focusing my worship towards Him, if it helps me in actually uh, in increasing my focus when I'm actually praying to Him, don't you think it is correct? Brother said that if that idol helps me in focusing God, isn't it good for Him? But when God says, don't make an idol of me, and yet you tell me it helps me in focusing, on God, is it right or is it wrong? If you love God, will you obey God or not? If you love God, you have to obey Him. Suppose you're working in a company and the boss tells you, the boss tells you that come on time, you have to come at 10 o'clock sharp. You say, no, if I come 11 o'clock, I will sleep, I'll be more fresh, I'll come at 11 o'clock. Is it right or is it wrong? So that's wrong. Then some people come at 10, some people 11, some people 12. No, no, but you know, I know I can work better. Some people come at 1 o'clock, some people come at 2 o'clock. Do you think the company will function correctly? No, I love my boss very much. The boss says, come on time, 10 o'clock means 10 o'clock. If you don't love your boss, then you may come late and maybe write in the register, I've come on time. That's cheating. So God has clearly mentioned in the Quran that idol worship is prohibited. It's even mentioned in the Hindu scriptures. Clearly it says, as I mentioned earlier in Sveta Sveta Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19, in Yajurved, chapter 32, verse number 3, Na tasya pratima asti, of that God there is no pratima, there is no image, there is no photograph, there is no painting, there is no portrait, there is no idol, there is no sculpture, there is no statue. So when God is saying there is no statue, no sculpture, you say, no, no, to concentrate I require God. This, who says that? The Hindu Pandit. When I speak to the Pandit, that it's clearly mentioned in the way that idol worship is wrong. What they say, no, no. Initially, when you're in the initial stages, at the lower level, you require idol to concentrate. When you reach the higher stage, higher consciousness, idol is not required. So I tell the Hindu Pandit, the Muslims have already reached the higher consciousness. Uh, sir? Sir, but if it is helping me, helping me in any way, why would God say that do not do it? Because you're degrading God. I'm asking your boss comes at 10 o'clock. No, it's helping me. If I come at 11 o'clock, I'm feeling happy. So the boss will tell you, if it's helping you, get out of this company. Go and join some other company. Someone comes at 10, someone 11, someone 12. Your employee, you tell come at 10 o'clock. I mean, your employer says, I will come at 12 o'clock. I feel happy. I feel good about it. I'm praising you. Very good, boss. Will you like it? Every day he says, my boss is very good, my boss is very good. You know, tasbih, you know, rosary, my boss is very good. Other employee comes at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, my boss is very good, my boss is very good. The boss will say, Bye. you stop praising me, you come on time and do your work rather than praising me. So your God, your creator has told you in your scripture, Hindu scripture, in the Christian scripture, in the Muslim scripture, don't make idol. You're degrading God, God is so powerful, you're making an idol out of, and who makes that idol? Who makes it human being? So God will tell, I have created the human beings, not the human beings are creating me. What nonsense it is. Sir, so we're not... you, when God is telling you, don't require idol, concentrate on God without idol. So we're not creating God when we're making an idol. And, I'm, and I think that we're not degrading him when we make an idol. It's just that if you make a form of him and, and assume it's a, it's a, there's a part of him, even if it is not there. Is that what is, is mentioned in your Vedas? Sir, I am, no, I am not an Hindu, so I do not believe in the Vedas. What are you? Are you a Christian? Sir, I am a Jain. Jain. Jains believe in God? Yes, sir, they do. Do you know your Jainism? Sir, Who is your God? Tell me. Sir, Lord Mahavira. He is the Tritanka. He is not God. You don't know your Jainism. Sir, I might not know, not Jainism know an entirety. Jainism is an atheistic religion. 
Jainism is an atheistic religion. You're mixing Hinduism with Jainism. So I claim that I'm not in Hinduism. I know you're not a Hindu, but if you're a Jain and you're saying Mahavir is God, where is it mentioned in your Jain scripture Mahavir is God? He's a Tritanka. Yes, sir, he is. He's not God. So, but then we worship him and all the other Tirthankars. But he is not God. Did Mahavi tell that you should worship him? I, like that, I have not read you the You don't gems. know, that's what I'm telling you. You don't know what Mahavi said and you're saying Mahavir is Tritanka. Isn't it your duty that you should find out what Mahavir has said? Yes, sir, it is. So, so what I, that means you're an illogical person. Sir, when you I'm... join a company, don't you follow the rules and regulations of the company? Yes, sir. Jainism is an atheistic religion. So there was they a... believe that someone who comes in life, dying, birth, birth, death, birth, death. If you're free from the cycle, when you don't have any negative or positive, you get nirvana, moksha. There are 24 people who have attained moksha according to Jainism. Yes, and sir. Mahavir is the 24th Tirthanka. Yes, sir. 24th. Yes, sir. He's not God. Yes, sir. So that means you don't know your Mahavir, you don't know your Jainism. So how can I talk to you about Jainism? Sir, uh, I'm not talking here that... Sir, what I'm asking is that if is idol worship... Sir, what you're telling me is that uh, what because it's mentioned in the Quran that idol worship is wrong... Mentioned that's in why Quran, it's mentioned in Bible. No. It is mentioned in Quran, mentioned in Bible, mentioned in Hindu scriptures that idol worship is wrong. So where do you get this philosophy from? Sir, 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 uh, my saying, my point is that we, we are assuming here that if Quran is actually what God has told, so that means that uh, that's why idol worship is wrong. If I say that, if I argue, that, it might be a pointless argument, but if I argue that Quran is not uh, the the word the words of God, then what is the uh, what is the actual logic that why idol worship is Very wrong? Very good. So what is the word of God? You have to tell me. If Quran is not the word of God, then which is the word of God? Sir, I do not know. That's why I'm if asking you. If you don't know, I know. Now, so you follow me. If you don't know, you ask a teacher. Now, a student tells the teacher, 2 plus 2 is not equal to 4. Teacher says, what is it? I don't know. Sir, but if I'm not convinced of the answer, then obviously ask If you're not convinced, ask, that's ask the again. reason. Did you hear my early answer? Have you seen my tapes? No, sir. This is the Go. first time attending you, Fine. your lecture. Have you heard the earlier answer which I spoke to an atheist about science? Were you paying attention? So maybe I was not present in the hall that time. I'm, can you, uh, so which answer you The thing is that if you're not available, what I request you, you go and see my video cassette, Is the Quran God's Word, my DVD. Uh, can, you repeat the DVD? can you repeat the name? Is the Quran God's Word. Is the Quran God's Word. And inshallah, if you watch it with an open mind, you will inshallah accept that Quran is the Word of God. You will believe that there's one God who doesn't have any idol, and inshallah, you'll accept it. So go and see that DVD. It's a four hour DVD. And inshallah, if you have any queries, you can write to my email, zakir at irf.net. Thank you, sir. Yes, go ahead on the right-hand side. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to ask a question related to the Christian who asked a question before. And you mentioned that uh, the soldiers stabbed Jesus when he was still alive before he was buried. My question is, did Jesus actually go to the cross or was he saved from ever having any of the pain? Sister, what's the name, sister? My name is Rachel. Sister has the question that when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, when he was stabbed by the soldiers, she's asking, did Jesus, peace be upon him, actually go to the cross? And was he in pain or was he safe from going to the cross? Now, both these incidences, details differ as per the Quran and the Bible. I am a student of comparative religion. I know both the versions. As per the Quran, the Quran gives the reply in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 157. It says that the Jews said in boast that we killed Jesus, the son of Mary. But the Quran says, Wama katalu, wama salabuhu. They killed him not, neither did they crucify him. Well, I can should be alarmed. It was only made to appear so. Anyone who differs is full of doubt. Illetabah zan with only conjectures to follow. Wama katulu yakina for a surety they killed him not. So according to the Quran, Surah Nisa chapter 4 was 157. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucified. He was not killed. It was made to appear so. How it happened? 
we are least bothered about the details. The next verse says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, 158, Allah raised him up alive unto himself. In the Bible now, for the Muslims, Quran says he was not killed, he was not crucified. We are satisfied. It was made to appear so. How it happened? There are many hypotheses. Maybe somebody was replaced in his place, or maybe may, we are least bothered. Quran says he was not killed, he was not crucified, we are satisfied, we are not bothered to know the details. If you read the Bible, if you read the story, if you read the Gospels, we come to know that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, the Jews, they alleged that he did blasphemy. If you read the Gospel of John chapter number 10, verse number 31, 32, when he says, I and my father are one. So they think that he claimed divinity. So they say that he being a man, you claim divinity. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says in the Gospel of John chapter 10, verse 32, that isn't it mentioned in your scripture that ye are gods? The person who speaks the word of God are called as gods. And the law is not broken. So here they mistook that he claimed divinity. They pick up stones to stone him. So then he says, many of good works have I done. For which of the good works do you stone me? So based on this, there's a trial in Pontius Pilate. And then he's put on the cross. And on, at that time, the Sabbath starts on Saturday for the Jews. It was in their philosophy that a person cannot be crucified on a Saturday which starts on Friday night. So because he was crucified on Friday, put on the cross on Friday afternoon, he was taken down from the cross early because a person cannot be crucified on Saturday. So because they take him out early, if I agree with the narration of the Bible, I assume that even if he was put on the cross, he did not die. That's the reason the soldiers, they pierce, and there you see blood coming out. And then in a hurry, they put him in the sepulcher. Now when they put him in the sepulcher, he is there in the sepulcher on Saturday full day, Sunday morning, the stone is rolled out. When Mary Magdalene comes in front of the sepulcher, she sees that the stone is rolled out. So who moved the stone is the question. So based on the narration of the Bible, even if I agree, hypothetically what the Bible says is correct, nowhere does it say in this narration that he died. So what we come to know from this narration, if he has to fulfill the sign of Jonah, that as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, has to be alive. If he's dead, that means Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, lied. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 38, he says, and he gives a prophecy, that as Jonah was, so shall the Son of Man be. If Jonah was alive, he has to be alive. So what I assume in my reading, as a student, after doing research, I don't believe Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, lied. So to fulfill his prophecy, I have to believe he was alive. He was put on the cross, but he did not die. If you read the dictionary, crucifixion, C-R-U-C-I-F-I-X-I-O-N, means to fix a person on the cross, and he dies on the cross. There is no word in the dictionary which says if you put a person on the cross and he does not die, what is it called? So new word we have to coin is crucifixion. C-R-U-C-I-F-I-C-T-I-O-N. It's a fiction, it's a story. He's put on the cross but does not die. So therefore I believe that if I agree with the Bible, it is correct, and Jesus did not tell a lie, peace be upon him, it was a crucifixion. F-I-C-T-I-O-N. It was not fiction, F-I-X-I-O-N. Hope that answers the question, sister. Thank you. Okay, so I, I believe we had a revert on the mic on the left-hand side. Is this correct? Assalamu alaikum. My name is uh, Muhammad Ali, and I've accepted Islam yesterday, before Friday prayers. And uh, I don't have any question or doubt as such because Islam is the only truth in this universe. But I just need one permission or one clarification, I would say, that uh, previously I was uh, working in a banking sector and the sources of income that bank earns is, uh, is, is on interest and there are other sources of income. So should I uh, continue with the banking industry or not? 
Brother asked the question that Alhamdulillah accepted Islam yesterday and he works in a bank and the source of income is based on interest. So can he continue? Brother, if you're working in a conventional bank, which deals with riba, which deals with interest, then working in a conventional bank is haram. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 270 and 279, that give up your demands of riba. If you give up not your demands of interest, then take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. So dealing in riba is a major sin. Working in a conventional bank is haram. What I would request to you is that you can join any Islamic bank. In UAE, in Dubai, mashallah, there are many Islamic banks. These Islamic banks do not work on the basis of riba on interest. They work on the Islamic Sharia principles of profit and loss. You should leave this conventional bank and join Islamic bank, which is based on the Islamic Sharia. Do we have any reverts from the mic on the right-hand side? On behalf of this non-Muslim friend, uh, it's like he's told me to ask Sir Dr. Jakar Naik that in Quran, para number 15, Ruku number 9, ayat is written as, Wakhul ja al hukku waj hakkal batil innal batil kan jahu So he want to know this related to Mahdi alayhi salam or what? The brother has quoted a verse of the Quran, but the reference was wrong. The correct reference is Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, which says, Bakul ja la kwazakal batil innal batil kan zauka. It is Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, which means that tell them truth has arrived and falsehood perished. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. Is it talking about Mehdi alayhi salam is your question? Yeah, advent or op- advent of This verse Mehdi is only salam. talking that whenever truth is heard again, falsehood, falsehood perishes. It's not talking about Mehdi alayhi salam. It's just talking that whenever truth and falsehood, when they compete, always truth will win. So therefore you have to be on truth, not on falsehood. It's nothing to do with Mehdi alayhi salam. It's just a general rule of the Quran, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that truth will always prevail over falsehood. Hope that answers the question. So one, one more clarification. The That's an, uh, brother, uh, just enough for now. We, unfortunately, we're running out of time. So we'll go to the sister's mic on the right-hand side. This is a question from a revert sister who doesn't want to come on the mic, but she wants her answer. She says that uh, she's become a Muslima, but her in-laws does not uh, really practice Islam completely. And uh, since she does try her best to learn Quran and she prays five times and she tries to follow other things about Islam, she's a keen learner. So sometimes she's not accepted by her in-laws and they don't treat her very well. How should she deal with this? Sister asked the question that a revert sister accepted Islam, but after she got married, the in-laws don't practice Islam. And when she practices Islam, they don't treat her well. Sister, the same thing as I mentioned in the earlier answer for a revert to say, how should she deal with the non-Muslim parents? The same answer is here. The in-laws are there. What she should do, if they say anything which is not going against Quran and Sunnah, she should follow. But if they say anything against Quran and Sunnah, she should not follow. Because the allegiance to Allah and His Rasul is much before than allegiance to the in-laws. In this, whenever any of your relatives tells you to do a thing which is against Allah's commandments or the beloved Prophet's commandment, you don't follow them, other things you can follow. So here with Hikmah, she should convey the message and she should try and make her in-laws better Muslim than what they were before. Hope that answers the question. Now we'll have the last question on this hand, on the left-hand side. Go ahead, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, Dr. Zakir Naik sahab. My name is Sarwar Alam for Media. My question is, what is the ruh? Ruh, please just answer me, answer my question. Brother says, what is ruh? Ruh is soul. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 185, Kullu nafsin zaykatul mu'an. Every soul shall have a taste of death. And that was the last answer. And I thank all of you, mashallah, and I thank the non-Muslims to attend this Dubai International Convention. Waakhru Dawan, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. May Allah reward our dear Sheikh, Dr. Zakir Naik. Just a piece of information before you all leave. 
For those who want to get to the station, either Nakhil Harbour Station or Rashidiya Station, because you may have your cars parked there, we do have some shuttle buses waiting outside in the IBIS parking area. So if you go to IBIS parking, you will have some shuttle buses to take you to those two stations. So please, everyone, a very big thank you for our dear Sheikh, Dr. Zakir Naik. May Allah reward you all, bless you, protect you, and thank you very much on behalf of myself and the organizers for attending the Dubai International Peace Convention. Please keep us in your dua. We ask Allah the Almighty that this convention may continue in many, many years to come. May Allah bless you, protect you all, unite all of our hearts. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika, ashadu an la ilaha illa anta, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There was only one who could comfort him to help him see the land. To ease his fears, to reassure was Khadija his wife. He said, Zamiluni, Zamiluni, Dathiruni, Dathiruni, a mighty task has come before me. I need you here.